Hello, and I hope you're having a fantastic festival so far. Uh, this session, Commissioning Panel Science, is part of the Ideas and Science strand supported by the Wellcome Trust. Uh, my name is Arimma, and I work at DocFest. Uh, I'm also a Wellcome Trust Engagement Fellow who's made that cross from broadcast, interactive, and somewhere in between. Now, um, here's today's opportunity, really, is to hear from the science commissioners. And one of the challenges that I kind of put to them in this session is to think about what's the way to a science commissioner's heart? Is it big, bold science, or are there kind of scope for smaller, more intricate stories alongside that kind of celebrity science idea? Um, but also, those kind of latest trends in technologies, if people have been heading off to the interactive sessions, um, there'll be alternative platforms that people might have heard stuff about. Um, so how are those kind of trends affecting uh, broadcasting around science commissioning? And of course, for you as filmmakers, what are those opportuni what opportunities does that pre present for you and how do you approach people? So um, we've got a very fantastic panel lined up. This is a sort of 90 minute session. We're gonna um, introduce each of our speakers. And um, so, so to my right, Helen Hawken, Commissioning Editor, Factual uh, and Natural History, Discovery Networks International. And then Ed Sayer, VP Commissioning, National Geographic Channels International. To my left. Tom McDonald, Head of Commissioning, National History and Specialist Factual Formats, BBC, the longest title ever. It's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Sarah Ramsden, Channel 4, Commissioning Editor, Specialist Factual. So um, we're going to start with, with Helen uh, to give us a bit of an insight into what we can expect uh, from Discovery. Okay, well, um, one of the things I wanted to start by saying is, um, you know, our context, I think, and probably that of Ed too, is a little bit different from uh, some of the terrestrial channels in when you said, you know, is it only celebrities? I think generally... Um, celebrities are not a core part of our programming or our science programming. We, and that's partly because um, we broadcast to, or, or the programmes I commission are made to go out in uh, over 200 countries of the world. And finding a face, a celebrity that can work in 200 countries of the world is very, very hard. Now, of course, there are exceptions. And we've got a really exciting series coming up with Idris Elba, which was initially going to be a UK and Western Europe project. And as soon as they heard about it, all of our international regions went, God, can we have that too, please? That's fantastic. And it is, you know, really fantastic, really exciting. But generally... Um, the thing that distinguishes our programming, I would say, is that any on-screen talent, and not all of our shows have on-screen talent, has to be immersed in the action. They can't just be talking about stuff, they have to be doing stuff too. And they are generally expert and passionate about their subject matters. Um, so... Uh, do you want me to show the clips and then shall I speak to them? I apologise, this first one is a bit long. Uh, it's just, it, it, had, it got pulled this morning for me and sent up from, from London. So I've got three clips. The first one is a clip from a fast turnaround um, show we did about the um, earthquake in Nepal called Aftershock, about disaster in Nepal. The second one is a clip from a forthcoming program called Incredible Engineering Blunders Fixed. Not the shortest, snappiest title, I think you'll agree, but it's a good show. And uh, the third clip is a clip of a series called Predators Close Up, um, which is a natural history show. And afterwards, I'll explain about how they are an example of some of the things that we're doing and looking forward to what else we're, um, we're, we're excited about. The first clip, um, we do occasional um, specials in response to big global events. So we did a one-off about the sinking of the Costa Concordia. We did a show when um, uh, a guy was found 
alive inside a car in Sweden and he'd been kept there for 60 days through the winter. Um, and I think, you know, what we bring to those specials and we continue to be committed to those specials is looking beyond the news and current affairs story. And generally that is the story of the science or the wider issues. And I think science and uh, science in its broadest sense absolutely is at the DNA of what, um, of what Discovery and Discovery Networks International does. I think we're always uh, looking to satisfy our viewers' curiosity of the world around them, but that has to be through stories that engage them. So we will always do those, uh, those specials that resonate um, around the world. The second clip is a new uh, series, as I said, and I think the genesis of this idea grew out of some of the UGC shows that we'd done before. I was nearly going to show you a clip of another show we do called You Have Been Warned, which is a show that we've been doing for some years, which is incredibly successful and, and popular around the world, looking at extraordinary YouTube clips and understanding the science behind them. And when we got to the third or fourth series of that, I think we all felt, this is great, but where do we take it next? And the feedback from a lot of our regions was that they missed some of the immersed um, boots on the ground, if you like. And so what we see in that show, we see Justin, who's, I guess, the linchpin, he's the uh, engineer, he's the investigative journalist, but he's working very closely with reporters around the world. Um, and we were very careful to make sure that they're not his reporters, he's not their boss, but they're a group of colleagues working around, around the world, investigating these amazing stories, seeing what's happening to fix them. And it's also a fantastic opportunity to test out new talent in a fairly safe environment. So we've discovered the... Um, a guy from Brazil who we really hope might have a future um, uh, presenting shows in his own right because he's a fantastic and engaging journalist. Um, so that has, he has re they have real expertise, they're issues that are relevant to people's everyday lives. They're all um, bits of engineering that impact on people's day-to-day -day lives in the countries they're in. And then the third um, clip is, I suppose, in a way, a more traditional discovery area. Um, it's a natural history show. It's um, one of a number we're um, either developing or have in production at the moment. And I think, you know, we're pretty excited about re-engaging with natural history, with uh, landmark science in, in um, the programs that we're both working on now and, and developing. And I've got a couple of shows in development. I'm just trying to see if the people are in the room um, uh, at the moment. Oh, yes, they are. Um, which are looking at what else can we do in the science space. So we've got a couple of ideas that we're developing actively which feel more event based in the, in the science space, bringing people to an amazing, engaging stories that happen at a particular moment in time, have purpose, and also have a legacy beyond that, because engaging in those kind of wider issues that are relevant to us all um, are, are really important, and our colleagues in the US are making a big, ser uh, a big uh, feature documentary um, or, or broadcasting one called Racing Extinction, which is about the engagement with um, conservation issues and racing extinction. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's a broad overview of what we're doing. I think we feel it's an exciting time. We're looking for lots of new ideas at the moment. We've just had a sort of creative renewal at the top of both Discovery in the US and Discovery Networks International. So we're kind of actively in the market for the best new ideas. Thank you, Helen. Uh, just to pick you up on, you talked about user-generated content. Is that content that was uh, found on the internet and then merged into that particular program, or is it that people are going along with the idea that they might 
capture some footage as, as part of the... Um, both, I would say. I mean, You Have Been Warned is a series which takes footage that is already on the internet. It's basically a rude tube with science. Um, but for uh, the aftershock disaster in Nepal, we went out and solicited content that people had captured on their iPhones as part of what ITN Factual did when they were uh, looking at getting the most, the greatest immediacy uh, of that storytelling. So, so both. Okay, thank you. So moving on to Ed, uh, would you like to introduce your perspective on this? Well, it's quite interesting. You said earlier on about um, what's the best way to uh, a science commissioner's heart. And, and for me, um, the Americans have a saying, which is go big or go home. And, uh, and let me just talk a little bit more about what that means. I think that science programming, programming and in fact, factual programming as a genre on a whole, is in a massive battle at the moment with the advent of uh, the, you know, the rise of Netflix and, uh, and other OTT programming. And, and when you're up against big dramas like Game of Thrones and box sets, that is how do you make your mark? And, and for us at National Geographic, it's all about having the really big ideas, taking the really big swings, taking the big risks. And uh, so the shows that, um, well, the show that, that I'm going to talk about, just to kind of give a bit more colour to that, is uh, a show that in fact just went out on uh, Sunday, it's continuing to go out at the moment on our channel called T-Rex Autopsy. So why don't I just show uh, our first clip, which is, I thought I'd show a kind of, um, uh, rather than the clip of the show immediately, I thought I'd show um, uh, a behind the scenes making of, because it's quite fun and you all make programmes. <laughs> Helen just asked me whether I chose that clip because I was in it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> So um, I just want to talk a little bit about um, T-Rex autopsy and why that I feel that does fit into being go big or go home and taking a big swing in the space. And what I really wanted to do when we uh, commissioned that show was could we tell the story of dinosaurs in a really uh, different way? Um, you know, I think traditionally um, um, both our channel and Discovery and other uh, channels before that have done dinosaur programming, especially the BBC, um, with Walking with Dinosaurs, um, that, that they were very CGI-led and uh, or it was always a guy with a paintbrush with a big beard and a hat and crouching down, brushing off bones of dinosaurs. And I really wanted to see whether we could make uh, a show which was really visceral, which really brought a, a dinosaur um, to life for the viewer and engage a broader audience. I think that not just... Um, making a, a, a show that was going to be um, kind of skewed for the science geek, but actually one that you could sit down with your uh, children to watch and, uh, you know, uh, your wife or your partner and try and create a bit of event programming, must-see programming, programming that was going to kind of um, smash out into the papers and, and make a noise, rather than being completely... Uh, ratings driven and I think that for me science programming needs to do that it needs to really kind of uh, smash through and the, the, the difficulty we had with uh, T-Rex is I think there's always a little bit of cynicism about when you do build a massive 40 foot model um, that everyone is going to ask you well where exactly is the science in that and in fact the process that we went through was absolutely incredible. So the, 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 the model of um, uh, our dinosaur, uh, Ed Wiener, <laughs> um, uh, was built, uh, it was taken from uh, University of uh, Chicago's scans of Sioux, which is the most um, uh, complete uh, fossilized skeleton of a T-Rex that's ever been discovered. And so using that, we then contacted the world's leading um, paleobiologists and paleontologists, and we got all the, the latest thinking and papers. And for the first time, we put them all together into one model. And, and what's quite interesting about the scientific world is, in fact, you've got all these amazing experts from all four corners of the globe 
all um, publishing papers, but actually they never kind of put everything together. And that's what we were able to do, is put all the thinking together. And then, after we put all that together, um, it was then peer-reviewed again by the world's top scientists to make sure that everything that we had created was 100% accurate and uh, to the latest current um, uh, paleological thinking. How did, you, how did you stack up with the, uh, the peer review of your work? Well, fine. So we, we um, don't forget, National Geographic is the only broadcaster in the world that actually is aligned with a scientific organisation. And so um, that, uh, and we have, uh, as many people who've made shows for us before, um, a pretty fearsome stands and practice department. So um, everything is uh, double checked by them as well as our, our, our scientists. And um, so what we ended up with was just a, an incredible piece of special effects for our world leading paleos to actually, uh, we gave them a device for them to explore uh, the, the, you know, the inner workings of a dinosaur. And by exploring the inner workings of a dinosaur, you uh, get an amazing amount of takeaway from it. Uh, one of the most exciting things that when we first started talking about the show was, like, do you know how you age a T-Rex? Well, it's a bit like uh, a tree that you cut through its major bone, you're able to cut, uh, count the growth rings on its bone. And of course, um, uh, me being me, I wanted to, to do that in the, like, how do you take the leg off a T-Rex? Well, obviously the answer's with a chainsaw. But, um, so we had uh, Luke, our, our, our veterinary surgeon, carve off the leg. But the clip I'm, I'm going to show you next is the, um, the, the section where they take the heart out. And what was really fascinating about that as well was when we were designing our dinosaur in CAD, in, in, in the computerized scans, um, uh, biologists um, believed that the heart would be 1% uh, size of, the, of your body. That mammals have, all you guys have got your hearts, a 1% size of your body mass. And so um, we, they thought that's probably what was um, going to be in our dinosaur. And in fact, it turned out it wouldn't fit, it was too big. And uh, much to the scientists' surprise, um, uh, the heart was a lot smaller, which then indicated that the heart was probably a four-chambered heart like a bird, which therefore also indicated that it was v uh, very likely to be uh, a warm-blooded creature. Um, so I, 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 when I say go big or go home, I, I really do mean go big or go home. Uh, so I think that's just, um, from my point of view, a really good example of um, the kind of uh, science programming that we're looking for. And, uh, you know, I think that when you're developing shows to pitch to us, uh, I think you need to be thinking about I wouldn't worry about the money to start off with, and, I, I, and it's, it's nice... I, I was going to ask, how much did that cost? A lot. And I think... Ballpark? The, uh, <laughs> a lot, a lot. <laughs> I think if you think about tariff to start off with, you're never going to come up with a big idea, like a really, truly big idea. And I think what you need to do is really think, what if money was unlimited, which it isn't, but if it was unlimited, what would you like to do? What are the big questions you'd like to answer? Uh, and what do you think um, would be on the front cover of the National Geographic magazine? You know, you think about big science, exploration, adventure, um, answering the big questions. And I think that is absolutely, for me, what the core of great science programming is. And I, I like to think that, um, you know, we have done that, albeit with a bit of schlock horror with uh, T-Rex autopsy, but um, that's what I think the industry needs to be tasked with. And it's a very, very exciting time to be working in this genre. So we've heard, heard from Ed, go big or go home, money's no object? Not, it's not quite like that, but I think the budgets that we play with are very significant. And um, if there's a will, there's a way. Hamish said at another panel, didn't he, that if that uh, um, model had been a house, it would have had to pay mansion tax. That was my, that was, that was my quote. You see <laughs> he stole it then. <laughs> yeah. So from, shit, from, from stolen quotes to the audience, I wondered at this point if there were any questions just um, at this stage. Um, have we got any questions? And if you could wait for the microphone. 
So, so over here. Hi there. Uh, this is a question for Ed and Sarah. Um, with the T-Rex Autos team, and Sarah, is that something now, seeing those clips you wish you had on Channel 4? And to Ed, like, there's obviously a bit of a blur between the reality and the fiction because in terms of it's fake, it's not a real T-Rex. And I think in, I saw a clip yesterday where one of the scientists asked, you know, we want to find out how it died. So I'm just, trying to, I'm just interested in how that's presented to the audience. Careful how you answer, Ed. This is the team that created Inside Nature's Giants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go first? I, I was looking at it, and half of me was thinking, oh, my God, it's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, why are they wearing the, the theatre swabs? All that fake blood, the fake blood on the face. There's Paul Wooding with his shoe, silly shoes. And, and, and the, the ludicrousness of the fact that the very people that had to decide what the internal organ configuration were were the very experts that were presumably doing the cutting up. And I don't know if you had the Chinese walls and you separated them. So I can really criticise it for, for my sort of highfalutin sort of position. But it looked bloody brilliant. I mean, I've actually really, I really wanted to see what was inside the heart and, 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 and I love the chutzpah of it and, it and it's great. Yeah, I mean, if we, I would probably have commissioned it, yes. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. <laughs> Could you have afforded to commission no, it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's the bigger question. <laughs> um, uh, to your point about, um, sorry, what was your point again? What did you want? <laughs> Oh, right, yeah. Well, uh, that's all part of the narrative structure. So, listen, there, is, there are several ways we could have played that, right? So, um, we could have taken it to the Natural History Museum. We could have put a live studio audience. We could have had a presenter there and the team behind them and him explaining what the team were doing it. And we could have done it in a very kind of trad, possibly more BBC kind of way. Um, for me, I was trying to engage uh, a, a younger audience at the same time and so, of course, you have the opening sequence with, you know, what if the government found the T-Rex? And I think, you know, the big plane landing in and the nose opening up and the lorry comes out. And I think that's all, um, you know, you can have a bit of fun with science programming. I think people will always kind of go, oh, this is bullshit, it's not real. It's like, well, of course it's not real. But you, you're allowed to have fun. And so the narrative uh, throughout that show of kind of, uh, if we can work out how it died, we can show how it lived. You have to have a purpose, and uh, a, 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 an autopsy does do that. And so by Luke trying to figure out what killed that T-Rex, he's able to then, we, we have a device of going in through the different organs uh, to try and tell you how it lived. What did kill it? Uh, it was a massive fall. It broke its mm. neck. Spoiler. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Netflix and Amazon, but we'll save that one for later. Um, let's move on to Tom McDonald and your take on uh, the same subject area. You didn't ask if I would have commissioned it, so we can come back to that later. You assume no. Um, so uh, I'm just going to use this opportunity to say um, people are probably aware that there's been a restructure and factual at the BBC. So. Um, I, I, I guess what I want to say about it is that it, I hope that it signals that we are more committed than ever to specialist factual. So we now have a specialist factual commissioning department which is run by Martin Davidson and then I'm running natural history and the unwieldy specialist factual format. So I think the thing to say is, I think I agree with what Ed says, I think it is a challenging time not just for specialist factual but for all factual television. We all know we're not just competing with Channel 4, ITV, Sky, we're com competing with um, platforms that we might not have thought we would be five or six years ago. And I guess our response to that at the BBC is to think really hard about how we, I'm just going to use loads of commissioning buzzwords, so forgive me, innovate in form. So uh, I want to say that we are still committed to making landmark science programming, but we're also trying to react to what seems to be changing needs from the audience. Uh, Martin said at his panel a couple of days ago that a, cu a couple of years ago, those big landmark pieces with a presenter on the top of the mountain, I like to describe it as we're doing incredibly well. We know that audiences for those shows are declining. That doesn't mean we're not going to, we're, we're walking away from that territory completely, but it's just got to be part of the mix of what we do. So for me and my team, we're now being tasked 
I was running Science and Natural History for a year until now, but tasked with finding uh, content which is both science and history, but which takes and borrows and steals the forms of factent, features, more populist forms of television. So I'm just going to show a few clips um, just to give you a flavour. I'm only going to show half of what I put together because it's very long. I was hoping I'd be able to go look at this range, but it's sort of half the range. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to say, the thing that unites them, I guess, is that I'm incredibly proud that over the last year we have established a number of returning formatted science titles. So Trust Me, I'm a Doctor will be coming back through its third and fourth series this year. And Now to Save Your Life is currently on air and it's a second run for that. Scrappers, which is at the end of the tape you've not seen, is a, a, an observational documentary in a scrapyard. It started on BBC One, it's moving to BBC Two this year, so for a second run. Um, so I guess in terms of what we're looking for, in terms of my team, so myself, Craig Hunter and Lucinda Axelson, we're looking for ideas like Mumbai Railway, which uh, are titles which will be stripped across a week. So that will be a week strip. It's an as live show for presenters in the world's busiest railway station. So titles which can have massive impact in the schedules because to Ed's point, you're, you're competing with a changing market and to try and have things that land big and make noise as it were for the channel is really important. I think so it's either big event pieces and I think we should all unpick what event means because it's become one of those words that we all bandy around now like scale, we all want scale, of course we do. Um, and then the other thing I'm looking for are, are titles which could return and I think, you know, I guess what I want to say is we've proven that we are trusted by the various channels to deliver titles that can return. I think when, when we commissioned Trust Me I'm a Doctor, what's weird about it is I think at the time none of us were sure whether it would land or not. Now it feels like it's a no-brainer. It's obvious that it's there. And it's not that I think it's the most innovative piece of television. It's a multi-presenter magazine show. But what I'm really proud of is it's got really bloody good science journalism at the heart of it. And it was responding to... It just happened to be a title where it felt like the audience had been waiting for it for quite a long time. It was sort of a, a post-embarrassing bodies medical show with a very, very different tone in a space that Channel 4 had been in very successfully for a long time. Um, and then the last thing is with What's the Right Diet for You, it was a, um, not only did it do fantastically with our app that you could find out what was the right diet for you, 1.5 million people downloaded it, thank you marketing press department for letting me know that, um, but um, it was again a stripped show with a big experiment at the heart of it. Um, so. I'm pretty pleased with what we're doing in terms of what we're looking for and looking ahead. I continue to think that quite a lot of our content still takes place in an imaginary world quite far away from real life. And I think it would be fantastic to have ideas. One of the things I love about Mumbai Railway, even though it's got four presenters in that quite BBC way, is it does engage with real life. In a, it's not like Airport Live or being in King's Cross Station. Mumbai Railway Station is chaotic. And you feel that sort of sense of chaos of the people who work there and the people who use it every day. Um, a title I didn't put on this reel was... Um, a two-party we did earlier this year called Six Puppies and Us that RDF made for us that followed six families who were getting a puppy for the first time. There are probably people in this audience going, how is that science? Well, I think the series really, really delivered on, forensically actually, but in a very light touch way, on uh, puppy development. And uh, we're probably gonna do, we are gonna do a follow-up series a different, in a different form with RDF. So I think it's about, I'd like to be in the real world more. And I know that people, Ed said it earlier, people use it as a shorthand um, in that BBC way. And I think you all know what he means. And, and I guess I'd like to be, I'm really proud of the BBC and I'm proud of our science heritage, but I'd like some of our titles to be less bbc if that makes sense. I wasn't being negative. No, I know, I know, but I think there is a, I think there is a, I'm not being, and I'm not being defensive, but I think there is a sort of common vernacular in BBC programming which tends to involve um, well-educated presenters, and I think there is absolutely, you know, expertise, whether that's through the people making the programmes or the people with the talent we put on screen continues to be vital to what we do. So I'm not walking away from 
richness of content. And I think that the content we deliver is incredibly rich. I guess what I'm saying is we have to find new ways of telling those stories. And I, and I don't say that in a sort of doom and gloom way. I'm really excited about it. I think there's real, you know, the BBC of all the broadcasters probably has the most hours to play with in terms of Specialist Factual. So that gives us the opportunity to be risky. But, you know, when I, Sarah, will, you know, Sarah's going to talk in a sec when I stop blathering, but, you know, I was jealous of Secret Life at four year old. I thought it was a brilliant piece of television, brilliantly made, a really, really simple idea, which again, I think it will return, I'm sure, and Channel 4 are very good at, at sort of running with their successes, but I think it's one of those things where you go, once it's on air, you go, of course, why, was, why weren't people making that? But I know that if that had been pitched to me, I might have gone, mm, four year olds, really? Mm, is the audience gonna, mm? And I think we do quite a lot of umming and ahhing, and I think it's lovely to see a title break out like that, that had real science at the heart of it. So I think Channel 4 have done that, I think we've broken through with science titles. So I think we're in a good place. So the BBC's moving into the future slightly. Is that what you're saying? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably not. No. But, um, we, but we sort of need you still to be doing some proper serious science. None of us really do that much anymore. And we sort of always relied on the fact that the BBC will still do the cosmology series, will still do something with a bit of chemistry and a bit of metallurgy. I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. And, I think, and I think the thing is I'm probably talking to my tastes rather than the entire science department. One of the reasons there are now two heads of genre who are commissioning in science, both me and Martin, are that I think there's an important place for both those things. So we are still committed to Horizon. BBC4 still has, compared to other genres, a really big science slate. You know, we, will, we are conti proudly continuing to work with Brian Cox, with Alice Roberts. We're looking for the new inspirational expert speakers in subject areas. Natural history content, I think, at the moment on the BBC, if we've done anything, I think we've made it more content rich over the last couple of years. I think it's much less, of course we always rely on visuals and visual innovation, but I really think that if you listen to something like Shark, which was on BBC One recently, it delivered huge amounts of specialist factual content. So I don't want people to walk away from this session going, oh my God, we're only gonna make six puppies and us for the rest of our life. We're really not. Six puppies and us is a small part of a much bigger ecology. And Sarah's right, the BBC does have a responsibility, I think, in this landscape to commit to serious science programming. But then I think it's weird to sort of think, but in my mind I don't divide it like that because I think you can have something like Inside the Factory, which is a series about food, which, you know, are massively relevant to our audience. I think it delivers masses of science content. It's just not in a science wrapper. So there's, there's room for Brian, there's room for puppies and something else. We're not sure what that something else is. It's probably is just yet. Brian and puppies at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I absolutely know what that something else is. I think, I think the difficult thing for me on these panels is it's incredibly hard to distill that amount of range. But if you look at what's been on air already on BBC One, BBC Two and BBC Four this year, we've gone from single films about climate change uh, on BBC Four, single films about quantum physics, which you know I genuinely didn't understand, but in a good way while I was watching it, um, to Six Puppies and Us, through to, through to Shark on BBC One. So I think we're in a place where I'm saying we are a very big, broad church. I think the thing that will distinct, the thing that I need everyone's help with is landmark science has to innovate in the way that these specialist factual format titles, I would say, are innovating, you know, even in a small way. We all know that even though we're committed to landmark science and those expert presenters, we have to find ways of delivering that content in a modern, fresh way for the audience. You know, we have a series coming up for autumn called The Nine Months That Made Me. It's a Michael Mosley fronted series. That sounds like a continuum of what we've done before, but I think it's genuinely visually innovative. And I think for the first time, we're bringing ordinary people, real people, into a landmark science space. So as well as being about what happens in the womb, which is a story that's been told before, we will also be meeting those people where what happened in the womb is not what happened to most of us sitting in this room. So it will take some of, I guess, the grammar and the tone of what you might have expected from a Channel 4 body shock type show 
integrate that with really, really rigorous new science research and have a copper bottom credible presenter like Michael. Now, I don't know what that will end up like when we, we've not delivered it yet, but, but I don't, I'm not saying come to me to do interesting stuff, but can you carry on making landmark science over there? I think we all have a responsibility to deliver this, you know, the reputational bar still has to be really high, but I don't quite believe in the sort of false distinction of oh, there's this sort of fluffy stuff over here, and then there's the posh BBC stuff over here. There's something in between, hopefully. I wondered um, if we've got any academic experts uh, in the audience at all, thinking about that idea of new ideas, new talent, not that the creatives can't come up with it. If, if, could you just put your hands up? We've got, okay, so we have, we have got some academics. Okay, fantastic. Um, and then to move on to... Um, You're not allowed to speak, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're here. Thank you for being here. Yes. So, so being, being, being an academic, I know that we need time to think about our questions. <laughs> yeah, we're reflective. Um, so moving on to Sarah. Mm -hmm. As it's such a love fest and you were so nice about my series, okay. I'm going to be really nice about okay. puppies because okay. I absolutely adored it. And as Wimful knows only too well, I had a series very, very, very similar to it that I couldn't get through at Channel 4. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Um, so, um, I've got a tape, and um, watch out, as you watch it, for talent. Talent, huge, not celebrity, we don't do celebrity, but talent, crucial. Channel 4 talent with attitude and authorship and idiosyncrasy and something to say. Look out for a big returnable series. Uh, look out for the use of UGC and look out for my personal pa passion project, which, just to give you some advance warning, there's a clitoris being cut off mm -hmm. in this film, which is quite, an old f is quite an old film, but I just wanted to put it on as just a marker for what I care about. Um, so that wasn't all mine. Some of, obviously, there was Gay Wedding from um, uh, John uh, in the arts department, and there was also Life in Space, which David did. So, but it was just given an overview of the department. But, um, so as you see, there's quite a lot of talent there. So there was Rupert Everett, there was Guy Martin, there's James Rhodes, there's Arthur Williams, there's Grayson Perry. And we are very keen to find more people like that. Um, well, we'd actually like a little, little bit more than that because we'd actually love a woman and we'd like some diversity as well. So the big problem with them all is that they're all white men and we would definitely like to find more diversity in that sort of range. All of them are interesting people, all of them have issues, all of them have idiosyncrasies, they've all got attitude. Um, I'm also working, I'm doing a film with Jamie Oliver at the moment, I'm also doing a film with Kevin MacLeod and I'm also doing a film with Heston Blumenthal and a face, a name that people will come to, whatever they're doing, is really, really important for us. It's a, it's sort of, it's a way of making us stand out from the crowd, and we are very, very, very happy with the relationship we've got with people like Guy Martin, who, whatever we do with him, we get a lot of viewers, and it's just fantastic. Um, he's having not having a very good time at the TT this week. I'm afraid he was. This is every every year. It's going to be his last year that he's finally he's finally going to win the TT, and he's. He's not winning it, so he's going to. He's, which is quite good because it means he's going to want to do some more television. Um, so, um, if you can find us the next Mary Beard, I would love to find an older woman with attitude, authorship, and idiosyncrasy. If anyone in this room can find me the, the next Mary Beard, we'd love it. Um, you saw there four-year-olds. Tom has been very nice about it. That is, I put that there because we. It's really important for us to find returnable series. I mean, it's something that Tom's mentioned, it's something that's crucial for us, something that we can connect with the audience and then we can find, we can do eight of them, we can do ten of them and people will keep coming back. And it's the first time I've done a pre-watershed show for quite a while. My stuff tends to be quite sort of dark and dirty, a lot of my stuff. And so it's uh, really enjoyable for me to work on such a pleasurable series and I've just started to see the taste the tapes of the next group of kids that we're going to film with and it's one of the most exciting things that you can ever do. That moment when you see a taste of tape just gets your heart pounding with excitement about you know, how you can get the audience excited. And it's a very light touch science. There's not an awful lot of science in it. We were sort of quite determined. We didn't want it to feel like Child of Our Time. We wanted it to be able to play in that features slot. It's actually a lot of entertainment in it. It's three quarters of that series is Kids Say the Funniest Things. It's almost a comedy show. Um, Jay, our creative director, has uh, a lot of cross-departmental collaboration and I took it to the heads of department breakfast 
And I was absolutely thrilled to see the response that the drama department had to it. And they were looking at it like we'd cast it as a drama. And that was really inspirational to go off and actually think how you can cast things like drama. So we're in production with a, quite a big series. And it's all quite exciting. I put the big wave in because um, we don't just do... Nat Geo mega things, um, the big, 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 big things. We're also looking for things to, so it sounds so cynical, but to fill the schedules. We're looking for cheaper things that can fill the schedules, and we're very, very up for co-productions, and, and we're really into sort of male skewing, upmarket UGC things, and I thought that wave was it's the best wave I've seen. Um, and he shot that himself. He was um, off the oil platforms, and uh, he, he has to be there all year, and he, he's just got really good at filming, and he's filmed all this stuff himself and brought it to us. You were asking the question before about, do you ask them to do it, or do they do it? It's extremely complicated in terms of compliance, because if you ask people to send you things, you have instantly then got a responsibility towards them that they don't kill themselves while they're doing it. So there's really complex release forms that if you've asked someone before they've shot it, that they have to fill in, and it's actually quite uh, difficult to get those. Um, and then the, la the, last, the last thing, of course, is the, the passion project. I, in our department, we, we feel it's really, really important that we do these left-field, difficult, taboo-busting passion projects. Um, John Hay did Gay Wedding. Uh, David Glover did Paedophile Next Door, which was a very insightful look about trying to treat paedophiles before they actually offend. And he also just did Stranger on the Bridge which was about, a, I don't know if you saw it, it was about a man with schizophrenia that was about to commit suicide and then someone talked him down and it was his mission to find uh, the man that had saved him. And I, I did a, uh, a big sort of reality series about terminal illness a couple of years ago called My Last Summer and I did Cruel Cut. And, and it's the, the, it is for us, I think, in Channel 4, the thing that really gets us out of bed in the morning that is we can still have a chance to do those difficult, complex really hard to deliver films and we we are not getting sent anywhere near enough of those sort of films and we really we really want lots more and and they nearly always work out really well because they're loud and confident and they've got something to say and loads of them get nominated for BAFTAs so it's a sort of win 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 um and that's sort of an overview of my sort of stuff can I, can I just um, add, actually, um, yeah. uh, well, first of all, your FGM film, I think it's absolutely um, the, the thing that Channel 4 and BBC should be doing. I, I, I just think it, it's such an important film to be made and that kind of science, really challenging. So I really applaud you for that. I think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but the re my point was, actually, that um, just for producers out there to know that, in fact, Live From Space was a co-production with National Geographic. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, in fact, it ran on two nights. So we uh, did the, uh, the first swoop around the world, and it went out in uh, 171 countries worldwide. And then uh, it was geo-blocked, and, and then uh, um, Channel 4 took that. So um, when you're kind of talking and thinking about your big projects and trying to, to raise the funding as well, you know, we do work with Channel 4. I'd love to work with the BBC. I think... Um, People have historically always said, oh, there's, you know, obviously always uh, difficulty with back end and rights and everything else. But I'm a real believer that uh, those kind of issues can be overcome. So, uh, yeah, Tom, I look forward to working with you. Should we, should, we, <laughs> should we tell them about our other co pro Is that? Yeah, go yeah. on. Yeah. So, we're doing something else together, which is very, very cable ish for us. Uh, but it's uh, got some really quirky talent, Tim Shaw and Buddy Monroe. And they are looking at the, the most ludicrously outrageous, gross out, dangerous stunts online and recreating them and find, trying to pick apart the science of them and how they actually work. And it's a sort of comedy fact end engineering show. That's right, yeah. yeah. You've got it nailed it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so just so the, you can pitch to more than one of us at once and so we, we can get together sometimes and co-produce. Yeah. Fantastic. So it, it's time now for you to be thinking about uh, questions that you might have, but I'll, I'll kick off with one. Um, we talked a little bit about diversity, Sarah. You, you, you brought it up um, and thinking about audiences. I, I did wonder for, for, for each of you, um, kind of who's watching? We, we, we haven't picked up on the audience side of things. Um, we had the challenge about Netflix and Amazon and so on, but um, specifically for the kinds of programmes that you've introduced, 
Who, who are the audiences? Uh, our audience is a bit younger than the BBC's in places. That's really important to us that we get uh, we have younger people watching, but we still have quite a lot of ABC ones that are also important to us. Um, it's 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 where in cable land, it's more about the the getting a purer. Uh, male demographic to serve the direct advertisers with us it's a little bit we need to be broader so for example in the thing that I'm co-producing with Ed at the moment I'm keep on trying to put slightly more female touches to it because it's really important it doesn't present solely as male so we, we find it harder to get bulk uh, if, if, we've, if we seem to be very niche um, so we, we just want lots of people and the younger the better um, I, I'm very lucky in the sense that half of my remit is natural history and natural history is the most extraordinary leveller in terms of viewers so that reaches an, for factual television incredibly broad demographic by age, by gender, by parts of the country um, and then it's on a title by title basis so something like An Hour to Save Your Life skews very young for BBC Two when I say very young it's not that young, but it's keeps very young for BBC Two. Um, other titles, for example, Our Truth About Strand on BBC One, again, does very well in 16 to 34, um, and, and attracts a very diverse, um, underserved audience. So it is on a title by title basis. I mean, like Sarah, I, I mean, BBC Four's remit is slightly different, but we're thinking of, when we're thinking about BBC One and Two, what I'm looking to do is, is serve the biggest, broadest possible audience. And I think, but I'm not naive to think that a big part of that is making sure that the presenters that we use reflect Britain back at itself. So, you know, a lot of the talent on the tape that I just showed you are white men, the same with Sarah's. So I'm incredibly proud of the range of presenters we work with, both, you know, both female and diverse in other ways. Um, but, uh, but like Sarah, we need to find new voices. Interesting, something that Sarah said, it really chimed with me, is that I think idiosyncrasy and eccentricity are really important, and we probably don't have quite enough of that yet. You know, the reason someone like Mary Beard is mentioned on panels like this is that she's not just expert, she also is absolutely distinctively herself. So I think you're looking for that, another commissioner buzzword, but that authenticity, that sense that, that and I think it's why Grayson, is responded to so brilliantly, but to, on Channel Four, is that he he is him he is Grayson, the essence of Grayson. And I think you need to find people who don't feel as I think the BBC we can be a bit vanilla sometimes, and so looking for people who have a have a distinctive voice, whatever that voice may be, you know, married with expertise is hugely important. They don't want quite as distinctive as we do. The BBC will always be a teeny bit more vanilla. I don't know about that. You know, <laughs> try me. <laughs> Brilliant, Ed. Well, I, I, certainly diversity uh, on an international channel, we um, serve everyone in the world, and I think our programming um, uh, reflects that as well. So if you talk about diversity of age, for one thing, so you've got shows like Science of Stupid, which skew much younger. Um, I, I mean, Sarah's right to an extent that um, we are a male-skewed channel traditionally. I think we're trying to broaden that that out, but I think inevitably, uh, and I don't really want to speak for Helen, but I think that the kind of that that factual space in in cable it is more a, a male skewed, skewed uh, space at the moment, uh, and then diversity on um, uh, talent that we work with. Well, I mean, one of our biggest shows uh, uh, last year was Cosmos with N uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's obviously an African American. So I think that um, look, w we. Uh, and and um, you saw a clip of uh, uh, Dr. Tori Herridge who, um, from the Natural History Museum who is involved with um, T-Rex autopsy. So um, uh, absolutely, um, we're not fearful of, uh, of working with either sex, age, creed, nothing. I think it's whoever's right for the job. So that's an invitation, it sounds like. Um, Helen? Um, so I suppose I'm as... Similar in a way to Tom, but slightly different in that um, I'm not just talking about one channel when I'm talking about things that we're doing. I predominantly am commissioning stuff for main discovery channels, but we have discovery, which, yes, is 
more male skewing, although we're trying to broaden that out as far as possible. And I think there's been a real concerted effort. I don't know, people may have heard uh, Rich Ross from the US talking at Real Screen West, talking about broadening um, uh, the contributors in our programming. So that, um, so yes, there are those shows, but of course we have other channels like um, TLC, which skews more female, which has quite a lot of medical shows like Body Bizarre. We have ID, which has forensic shows, again, in the, that's about it's still in the science space, and Animal Planet, um, so that natural history shows can show on Discovery and Animal Planet, and those, TLC, ID, and Animal Planet, do skew more female. And, of course, being an international broadcaster, you know, in the UK, perhaps our audiences are, you know, 35 to 50, but um, in countries like Brazil or India, which have a huge, uh, there's a huge markets for us, we have much, much younger audiences. So shows like You Have Been Warned, which is outrageous acts of science in the US, uh, tend to skew more young. So I think it's, you know, don't get hung up, would be my message about the um, the age of the audience, bring us the ideas, the exciting ideas, um, and we'll try and work with you to solve the problems of whether it's how you fund them, how, you, how we aim them right for the right network. I think it's, it's um, there's, there's space for a lot of broad, um, uh, a lot of broad content that engages with different audiences. So it's time for questions, and I wondered if you, again, if you could wait for the microphone. So put your hand up if you've got a question. Yeah, okay, lady at the front. Thank you. Um, that was really exciting, and thank you for all the clips. A lot of the sessions that I've been to, people have talked about collaboration, and, you know, the poor old Brits, I'm sure it, almost everyone here is British, they think they're really poor. I mean, it's quite a joke. It makes me laugh. They're, they're so rich, they don't know what to do with it. But anyway, a lot of talk about collaboration. And I just wondered, um, Tom, particularly with the BBC, I mean, there was a very good session with Ian Katz talking about news collaborating more with documentary, et cetera. I haven't seen in a long time the kind of really beautiful science film that could be, you know, dramatised well. So there, w there was a book this year that I was dying for someone in your rich factual world to pick up H is for Hawk. Does anyone yeah. know that book? Yeah. Okay, but I believe it's been bought by a, one of the actresses in Game of Thrones right. is making it. But is that something that you would look at at all, working with your drama department or, you know, Sarah mentioned the four-year-olds being cast. So is there any of that coming up? Because it's such a beautiful way to watch science. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I love about being a commissioner at the BBC is you do, we do commission from factual four dramas a year. That's a, that's a sort of definite. So from the science department, I have nothing to do with it, but the Challenger film, which was RTS winning. Last year we made Castles in the Sky, which was about the invention of radar with Eddie Izzard. We have a film um, called Game Changer, which is about the people behind Grand Theft Auto coming up for later this year as part of the digital season. Um, so we're committed to factual drama. Martin's obviously looked after some brilliant dramas like 37 Days. Um, and Kim showed a clip from another drama yesterday. One of the things that I think we're getting better at, and um, uh, the clip from Kim's session, which is the Lady W film, that was a collaboration between drama commissioning and factual commissioning. And I, so I have a couple of projects at the moment that I'm working with Lucy Richer, who's a commissioner in drama, on, because she has the expertise about who the best writing talent out there is, who the best off-screen, you know, cinematographers, writers, directors, and I think I have a real sense of what would make a really good factual story. But I think, you know, we have to get better at that across the piece, and I'm sure this is true at Channel 4, it's very easy in your day job to talk to the same people in the office every day, and I think some of the best ideas come from, I certainly know that talking to people who work in entertainment is sometimes incredibly helpful. So we're doing a panel show later this year with Brian Cox 
I'm going to look after that title with an entertainment commissioner because he has that sensibility about okay, how does the grammar of a panel show work? How do you make you how do you make sure that you know there are enough jokes versus enough content? I know what I want the tone of it to be, but Alan Tyler, who's going to be working on it with me, I think will really help with the architecture of what the show is doing. So I think that's exciting. So crossing crossing genres is that something? And, and I think that you know obviously. We work very closely with our colleagues on the US networks, and I mean, they've just made uh, in the last few months a commitment to increasingly looking at um, dramas that tell factual stories, and um, that I know that there's quite a lot of exciting stuff in development or pilots or funded developments going on, which unfortunately I can't talk about at the moment, but which will. Um, be, there'll be more information about quite shortly about things looking at in the in the popular factual and popular science areas speaking to exactly that I think um, DNI I think we're kind of mainly looking to our colleagues in the US to do that there may be some opportunities but I think that's probably a little bit further down the line for us I, I, you know, yeah, I'd like to add as well that, uh, you know, talking, Thomas was talking about kind of cross pollinization between, between genres, and, um, you know, uh, uh, National Geographic does have a rich heritage of um, working with big names. You know, there was Killing Kennedy, Rob Lowe. Um, but also, we've got um, a, a new series coming out called Breakthrough, uh, and some of the episodes, in fact, all the episodes are, are made by big Hollywood directors. So you've got Ron Howard, who looks at longevity. Um, you've got Angela Bassett, who deals with water issues. Brett Ratner explores the brain. Peter Berg tackles pandemics. Paul Giamatti uh, investigates the latest tech. So um, I think it, you know, that's always, always another uh, really interesting approach, is, is not just talking to entertainment producers, but talking to the guys that go and make the big films, the big factual uh, features, and, 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 and seeing how you can make those work in the science space as well. Another question? Any more questions? Um, I'd just like to ask, I know um, Stranger on Bridge was uh, fantastic, but I just wondered about your, um, all of you about mental health and psychiatry and whether that comes in to your remit at all, whether it's just a bit too scary? <laughs> no, it's absolutely, we should be doing more of it. I mean, Channel 4 a couple of years ago did a, a season called Channel 4 Goes Mad, uh, and we had a sort of big reality show set up where people came and interviewed for jobs, and the people had to, uh, the, the board had to guess who, uh, work out who had a mental health issue, which is actually very, very similar to the Horizon that was done, uh, Horizon special that was done about five years ago, where the psychiatrists had to work out what mental illness people had. But, you know, it, it's... It's not straight on the nose. Both of those were quite uh, brave and edgy uh, reality show uh, constructed docs. Uh, but yes, we have to find a way to. It's oh, very, so it's very hard. I mean, the one thing that has never been done properly is depression on telly. It is yeah. really, really hard. And it, it's hard because um, people who are depressed aren't very good television subjects. It's a terrible thing to say, but it is brutally true. Yeah. And um, I've wrestled with it quite a while to think, how could we ever do depression? And I haven't actually. So it was, which is why I was really pleased that David's Strange on the Bridge um, actually, actually came up. But yeah, we, we, we need to find new ways. Just carry on the channel for Love, and I also really love that film. Um, anyway, <laughs> so um, uh, I think BBC Three in particular has taken quite a lot of the load, as it were, over the last couple of years. There's a really rich heritage very, very personal films, authored films which are about mental health. Um, Horizon, as Sarah said, we also did a, a, a Horizon did a brilliant film about autism with Uta Thrift, who again, when we're talking about distinctive talent, I think she was a fantastic, really distinctive, idiosyncratic piece of talent. But like Sarah, I think we need to do more. It's interesting, um, television goes in cycles, doesn't it? And there was a moment where both we at BBC One and Channel 4 were doing a lot of programmes about hoarding. And I suspect, certainly for BBC One, that that's not a subject we're going to be doing this year. I suspect Channel 4 I don't, know. I don't, I don't know. think so. Um, and so it feels like we're quite... Uh, we have a danger, all of us have a responsibility to not be faddy about these things. Because I think we tend to sort of latch onto one thing and go, oh, we'll mind that for a couple of years. And I think there are bigger, broader stories to tell. But yeah. like Sarah, I think part of, the, part of the issue with depression is what people often want in television programmes is a transformation narrative. Part of the reason that hoarding was so attractive on television is that there is both... 
mental, tra psychological transformation, but also visual transformation of things leaving the house. I think it's very, very hard for, for uh, you know, and I would love people to, to work with us to find smart, clever, new ways of telling those stories. Again, I think factual drama might be a really good way of looking at that. You know, if you think about what H is for Hawk is about, yes, it's not about depression, but it's about, it's about grief. grief. And I think yeah. it's really interesting that that's been made yeah. into a, you can see that that's perfect for a sort of factual drama. Um, but I would really like people to come to us. We had almost, uh, and I was really, really upset we didn't, the access fell down in the end, we almost commissioned a, a, a longitudinal film about a, an amazing schizophrenia trial that's, that's happening. Um, and in the end, we couldn't get the access because there was a, a very deep and real worry that our cameras would affect the experiment that they were undertaking, the, the trial. Um, we are doing a longitudinal film, uh, a two-parter actually now, a longitudinal, which has been in production for four years. Uh, by the time it will be on air, about a double-blind placebo trial for a new Parkinson's drug. Um, that, I think, will be a really, really outstanding, extraordinary piece of television. It's, from, from what I've seen, it's, it's, it's one of the most visceral things that I've been involved in. So, yes, not mental health, but, um, but tackling really difficult subjects is part of our remit. <laughs> I've got a sorry. I've got a, um, a feature doc involving a mental health issue, which I've been trying to get off the ground for about seven years, and and it might at some point see the light of day. But you still plug on on those really really difficult ones. But for in Channel Four, the other port of call is obviously our fact tent department, who do undateables, and they've also just launched Dementiaville as well, which is um, Dementiaville. Yes, oh, wow. which is not a million miles away from the series. Did you make that series at Wall to Wall? Yeah. Yes, it's not yeah. a million miles away from yeah. that, is it? Yeah. Yeah. The young ones, yeah. Yeah. I think that's an excellent question, actually, and um, I, I think that really highlights why the BBC and Channel 4 are there, uh, 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 to kind of tackle those subjects, which would be quite challenging for an international broadcaster to take on, because I think when you try and look at those kind of subjects, I think they actually become quite localised, because you'd be filming in certain centres in certain countries, which would then have no relevance for other countries. You know, why, why would someone in uh, at Thailand be concerned about the state of mental health in the UK? And trying to tell a, 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 a bigger, broader story about j global mental health is, would be too difficult for us. But that's why we must preserve and protect those guys at the other end of the table, because they're able to do those kind of things for this country that other broadcasters uh, can't. It's not because we don't want to, but we just can't. And I think, yes, I mean, uh, I very much echo what Ed had to say. I think, you know, we've got a little bit more scope because um, we do commission some local um, programming as well as international programming and I know that it's an area that my colleague Sarah Thornton who commissions mainly to TLC in the UK and internationally I know that she's actively developing some projects in that area at the moment um, because she does a lot of very uh, personal, very immersive stories um, which are broadly in the health and mental health spaces. So, but you're right, it, it, it's, it's fascinating, but I think it's, it can be hard if we're looking for something where we take the same you know, master of the show and show it in 200 countries or something. Um, one of the panellists at another session yesterday said that there's not that many s new subjects out there. It's just finding new ways to tell existing stories. Do you agree with that? Totally. I mean, I've, I've been in this business quite a long time. I've been around the block a few times. And um, there was nothing new. I mean, I'm getting pitched things the whole time. Oh, I did a series on that 10 years ago. Oh, I did a series on that 20 years ago. There's never anything new. But what there is new is completely original new ways at looking at them about juxtaposing new, different forms. And, and, and you can bring a completely fresh experience. And in actual fact, a very large amount of the audience don't remember the film that you had on six weeks ago, never mind the series that you had on 10 years ago. You haven't got to think about the past, you've got to think about the future. Is this going to present as fresh, original, exciting? Are they going to look at it in the Radio Times and are they going to say, oh my God, we've got to watch that? That's all that matters. 
I guess it depends what you mean by new. I mean, I think we are discovering new information all the time. Our understanding of how the human body yeah. works is evolving. Our understanding of climate change is evolving. So it, it, is our, is our understanding... I mean, one of the things that I ask often when I'm a pitch an idea, because like Sarah, I'm pitched the same subject areas over and over again, is why are we making it this year? And often it's a small thing that unlatches the programme, like whether that's an understanding of human psychology or it's an understanding of embryology or it's an understanding of how, you know, people have made films before when I showed a clip of Inside the Factory, which we stripped across three nights. It's not that food production hasn't been done before, but it hasn't been done quite in that way. So I think, you know, I think one of the things that we are guilty of sometimes as commissioners, and I think we can be quite intimidating when we say we want you to innovate, we want you to turn the wheel, often it's quite a small tweak that can have huge impact for the audience. And I think often people, I know when I was in the indie sector, and I've spent more time in the indie sector than as a, in a broadcaster, I would sort of go away sometimes scratching my head, going, all right, scale, bigness, new, what do they really bloody want? And I think actually it's about thinking about what that small tweak is that makes a massive, massive difference to the audience. Yeah, and I'd like to jump in there because I completely agree, I think. Um, so I've got... Uh, a new series which is in production at the moment with one of our uh, key on-screen talents, a guy called Ed Stafford, who did a series called Naked and Maroon for us. Um, and what this series does, he um, he's a great adventurer, a great explorer, um, and he wanted to show, wanted to prove that there were still adventures to be had in the world today. And he was incredibly intrigued by those weird anomalies you sometimes see on Google Maps or satellite images, and you think, what the hell's going on there? And so what he wanted to do was to go to those places to, um, to explore them for himself, not rely on scientists to go in, but to go there, because that's the kind of guy he is. And the thing that made uh, one of the shows I've just seen in the edit so exciting is he gets to this place, he can't see what's made the anomaly. He goes, I'm here, I just don't know what's going on. And he takes a little tiny drone uh, um, copter with a camera strapped to it that he's got in his backpack. I mean, he's carrying everything, he films everything himself. And he sets it up, it flies up, sort of 50 metres in the air, as it's flying up and spinning round, this kind of lattice work of uh, marks that he couldn't see suddenly becomes apparent. And it was just the ability to have one of those cameras that normally, uh, you know, a few years ago, you would have needed three or four people and it would have taken ages to do it and it would have been very expensive. He bunged it in his backpack and Unfortunately, that meant that in some of the shows it broke and we didn't get that shot, but it was exciting because it just meant that we could ever so slightly tweak and innovate. But it's exactly the same with your Plimsoll Productions Predators thing. Mm. That we, that, that how many times have we seen elephants before? But I, I wanted to watch that because I've never seen elephants' ears like that. I know, and we the were ears are gorgeous, aren't completely fresh they? insight. So when each new <laughs> bit of tech comes along, you can redo Tutankhamun, you can redo the pyramids, you can redo Titanic. If you've got a new piece of tech, it gives you a reason to go back and do the things. Like some of those yeah. great shows with yeah. LiDAR and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right, but one of the yeah. things that I think often happens, and I, I, I'm saying this to people who pitch to us, is that I don't think that the, the piece of technology, uh, everyone will agree with me, I'm not saying anything controversial, yeah. but the piece of technology is enough. So I no. cannot tell oh, it you it has to give you a new revelation. Exactly. I yeah. cannot tell you how many ideas we get pitched where we go, well, we're going to use drones to do it. And I sort of go, okay, let's start with the drones but we have to sort of go beyond that and I think you'll see that with the LIDAR scanning I think you know when Martin did Jungle Atlantis I thought it was really good because it felt like it was a very sort of good synergy of content and purpose and technology mm -hmm. and that's a much more complicated matrix than it looks and I can see that with Predators it feels like a sort of fantastic fit for the subject but I do think finding that marriage of technology and content is, is hard. It's almost harder in natural history, isn't Much it? Much harder, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm glad we picked up on technology. Um, well, Tom, you mentioned about apps. I, w I wondered about that kind of Snapchat generation that are locking us out of all of their content. What's that? Um, no, I'm joking. I'm joking, I know what it is. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, uh, Netflix, Amazon. How, how, how else are people tackling that challenge? Sorry, I don't... How, you, you mentioned that you kind of... Um, you had some apps that were connected 
to some of your programs oh, yeah. and your experiments? So, so weirdly, I mean, I mean I, 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 I'm going to say that what people say on, on Twitter when they go, these are my opinions, not those of the BBC. I'm going to go out on a limb. Um, I feel quite relaxed about the fact that with a title like Life Story, for example, which was our natural history landmark last year, I feel really rela relaxed about the fact that its viewing figures were strong, but not as strong as, say, Frozen Planet, because at the same time, some of the short form clips, like the Pufferfish clip or the Goslings clip, I hope some of you know what I'm talking about, otherwise I sound mad, um, reached millions of people and, and reached a very different set of millions of people. So I think in some ways, I think the way that we measure success has to start changing. Now that sounds a bit fudgy, but what I mean by that is, I think uh, for so long we've been used to being television commissioners, but I believe if you look at, Shark's a really good example, again, a solid performance on its overnight, but a, an amazing performance on the iPlayer for Factual, so over one and a half million people watched the first episode on iPlayer, which for Factual is very, very high, so, but we, that's heading into drama territory. And then some of the clips, like you saw a very quick bit of the Mobular Rape clip, then again, I think, it, I think its reach was, 30 something million people, don't quote me on that, I'm making it up. But you know, it was, a, it was a huge figure. So I think in a way, one of the things that I have to think quite hard about, am I committed to long form content? Absolutely, I, I, I love the BBC Hour. I don't always say that to people I'm in edits with, but I do really love the BBC Hour. Um, but I also think we have to find other, I think we should be relaxed about the fact that for some people, that pufferfish clip from Life Story was enough of Life Story for them, because that's a different kind of satisfaction. But it also becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because it starts to be discussed online and you suddenly realise it's actually getting lots of views online. So you think, oh, I better see this then. Yeah. And I, do, I, I watched Sharks on iPlayer. I, hadn't, I didn't feel motivated to watch it on the main channel, but I had a sense that something was happening, so then I had to go and see it. And, and, I, think, yeah. and I think one of the interesting things is that, and I know one of the challenges for me with natural history is people think they've seen it all before. And to be honest, I hadn't worked in natural history programming before I started working in the BBC. So I think I probably came into it thinking, well, how do you tell stories in a different way? And I think what tends to happen with our content, so having with Pets Wild at Heart, having with Shark, having with Life Story, having with Animal Odd Couples, is that a single clip seems to spark the imagination. And then those titles have a much longer lifespan than other factual because they become part of a different conversation that's not happening on the EPG, that's happening somewhere else. And I think that's really, it, it, just to sound like an old person, I'm like, that's really exciting that young people are doing that. How are they doing that? But no, but I do think it's really exciting. So we're close to time. Um, how do people get in touch with you if they want to put forward ideas? So if we could just have that going along the line. Email me. And don't do loads and loads and loads of work on something that I might already be doing with someone else. I'm quite happy if you, to respond with, if you don't mind a quick no, if you send me a paragraph. Um, we have something called BBC Pitch. And you should submit all your ideas to BBC Pitch. Um, it's there for you and for me, uh, but also, um, but also email me. And again, I uh, tend to, I, I mean, I try and be really fast and we have commitments to how quickly we get back to people. So um, I, I'd like to say I'm pretty good at it. I hope people don't disagree. Uh, same, email for me, please. Uh, likewise, email, um, that we have a, a small but perfectly formed team and I will, if I feel I'm too overloaded to deal with it, I will uh, make sure that somebody with a, a specialty or experience in that area gets back to you very quickly. Can I just say something? This is the longest panel I've ever sat, so thank you all for staying. <laughs> Those of you who stayed, I am so grateful. Thank you. <laughs> it was exactly 90 minutes. It wasn't, it wasn't. <laughs> it, just, it just felt like a long time. Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say one other thing as well. I didn't thank the companies that had made the clips. They weren't credited, so I'm going to thank RDF for uh, four-year-olds. Can I thank Love Productions for FGM? And can I thank Raw for the Storm thing? And can I thank North One for Guy Martin? I can't do that now because it looks like I'm copying. You know you are. <laughs> thanks. Go, on, thanks. go down, go down thanks. the line. Yeah, Impossible yeah. Factual for T-Rex. Okay. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, thank our panellists. Thank you, the audience, for your questions. <laughs> <laughs>